Hello everyone and greetings from India. Welcome to this online session on transport operation management. This program has been developed in cooperation with CII Institute of Logistics in India. The target beneficiaries are UN senior transport staff. As you're all well aware, transport operation is at the heart of peacekeeping activities of the UN worldwide. The key objective of this program is to enhance the competency of transport staff. And what we plan to cover up in this session, first thing is to understand the concept of transport operation management. What are the key drivers to develop the transport fleet policies? What basically really matters around. Now, next thing we'll try to touch on a little bit on UN driver's handbook. Because the drivers are the ones who ensure the safety, the right driving of the vehicles around, right use of the vehicles around. So we have the driver's handbook. The next we'll touch on this is how we manage the resources, the fleet management. If I remember correctly, the budget of the UN peacekeeping is around $9 billion on a yearly basis. Quite major share of this goes to the transport part. So how do we optimize these resources? Around? That's what we're going to touch on. Challenges in fleet management. Obviously, this subject, particularly when you're managing the fleet in many developing countries where we have many conflicts, in those areas around, certainly there are many challenges. How do we improve the performance? Around? You have the big fleet, obviously managing the fleet, the cost of the fleet. How do we understand the relationship between utilization and the cost? The key performance indicators, the KPI. So we'll certainly touch on the performance indicators and the KPI. So which are the KPI which need to be looked into it if I'm maintaining a fleet around? Broadly, what I look around in this session is to move, the way I understood UN is to transition from fleet maintenance to fleet management. The focus should not be just the maintenance, but to become the fleet management part. So when I say fleet management, it is becoming much more instead of proactive, so instead of reactive, it becomes a proactive. That's the way I look at it. It becomes more strategic. So if I summarize this, the, optimize, the objective of this session would be to optimize the resources under the transport unit, which is a big money, mitigate the risks, and ensure the fleet security around. Let's start with the very first thing, is the transport policy. Whether the transport policy of a nation, or the UN, it's basically a strategy. What you want from the strategy is there should be safe mobility of people, men and material. Its objectives broadly, what we talk around would be to improve the quality of life, preservation of health, the safety of transportation, which is very key. If you're going into the war torn areas, conflict zones, safety of transportation becomes very crucial protection of environment. So when we are running the big fleet, we are not damaging the environment. Part. So that also is important. So ecologically and socially, we are responsible and ensure economic development. So obviously when we look at the transport policy, we come with infrastructures, so which leads to economic developments. And this is how it is going on. Is it going uniform or is it going in a very corner? Around? Improvement and extension of connectivity. You want to connect the places around. So there are many other factors that influence the policy, such as funding is obviously one of the key criteria around how much funds you have, geographical features, and lastly, and the transportation what being used around. What type of transportation is commonly used? Now that gives you the broad picture of the national policies around, and even if the UN has to make their own policies. Now based on that, the broad objectives we come with the three policies around. So if I'm having a mission, UN mission in some place around, I'm trying to develop the three policy. 
Now, the fleet policy, the way we look around is how to optimize the three E's around. The very first E is economy. That means I should not be spending too much money on it. I should be very, saving should be their key facts. Efficiency of the things around. And efficiency means it's coming from the way input and output, how effective it is. So lastly is effectiveness. So the business processes are very important right now. I might be doing a great job in savings. I might be showing efficiency, but my processes are not very effective. So that means at the end of the day, the results may not be that effective. Outcome may not be that great. So three E's, the way let me again explain around. Economy, when we talk around, is the lowest cost for a given quality and quantity. So the lowest cost does not mean you compromise the quality now getting at the best prices, but not compromising on quantity. They're not cutting the corners. Quantity is same. And efficiency is defined as the extent to which inputs are used optimally. I have a fleet of 500 cars, but then only hundreds are being used, 400 are being used, only 10%. So that means I'm not using optimally to produce the outputs. So output is movement of the people, of so effectiveness is the next one, which can be defined as a maximum output. I have the big team of staff. Some staff are overused, some are not used fully. How do we mix the staff around? How do we mix the team of vehicles and staff and all the resources, I would say, to get the best out? Now, when we talk of fleet policies, obviously we have to talk about drivers eligibility because they are the key component. Now, who are the drivers who are eligible for this? And if you want to use for the personal use, who can use the age limit, the fleet services, the drivers, the routine responsibility need to be spelled out, emergencies, contact information, in case something happens because you are in a one town area, conflict zones around, anything can happen. What is the emergency contact information? Vehicle replacement, the vehicle is outdated, become very old, frequently breakdowns, then the replacement policy has to be. So risk management part, so how do I mitigate the risk of my team? I'm the chief transport officer, I have to work it out. How do I mitigate the risk of my team? crossing the border sometime. They have to cross the border from one nation to another nation. So what type of arrangement has to be done for that? Use of electronics, certainly that plays a key role, mobile phones, compliance, all these things. So this explains the response to drivers and documents to be kept in vehicle also. So the compliance mean when I say around the driver's responsibility and the document which has to be kept in the vehicle. So this gives you broadly the component which forms when if you're developing the fleet policy in short, these things have been covered up. Next comes the fleet management. So when we talk in reference to the fleet management, we're talking of organization transport resources. So your chief transport officers, unit, the transport unit has got wide range of resources in terms of staff, in terms of manpower in terms of vehicles, in terms of other things around, technologies. So those resources, how they are being used optimally. It encompasses activity like tracking the travel of the vehicles, which is very, very crucial. Where the vehicle is, I should be able to track it. Fuel, consumption part. Is the speed being maintained uniformly within the min and the max level? The maintenance. Frequent maintenance are being done, health and safety of driver, which is crucial. We want the drivers and the people who are traveling and that we want their good safety as well. So it helps to reduce the risk, improve the efficiencies, reduce the fuel consumption, maintenance cost. That is what we look around. So when we talk of fleet management, we are taking care of the fleet and ensuring cost effectiveness. Again, those three E's are relevant here. If we get back to the definitions, as I explained earlier, it comprises the target oriented. You have to have a target. You need to have a benchmark. I'll be touching this point later on when I come to the KPI. So you must be having a benchmark under different things. 
Okay, last year my consumption of fuel was this one, which is the major component I see in the UN in terms of expense and all. So where is my target and where I want to reach it on? My utilization of vehicle. What is my target and how much I'm doing it on? Optimal planning, supervisions, and control of the fleet operation based on the vehicle. And obviously, we are looking at internal and external factors. So when we look at this objective of the strategic fleet management, so as broadly said, the goals and objectives, increased efficiency, input-output ratios, the lower the cost of operations, optimal utilizations, improved compliance, ecological and environmental friendliness. You're not damaging the environments with your activities. Increase sustainability. The next is increase competitiveness and higher levels of user and customer satisfaction. So people who are using your services around, whether they are in the combat forces or in or the police, whichever the people team who are using your services around, even the staff, they should be happy. Let's understand the bigger picture of the fleet management. Obviously, when we talk of fleet management, as we said in the definition also, first I'll try to touch on driver's handbook. So the driver's is, handbook is there, which I know the UN has already developed, that that covers basically the information part, the procedures part, and the precautions drivers should the driving standards are there around, regulations, the norms for safe driving, training of the drivers, and recognitions. And if they are doing a great job, somebody has been a driver with you for a year and no accidents, done a wonderful job, they need to be recognized to improve the morale of them. The fleet controls, maintaining the fleet cost effectiveness and efficiency. And then come to the surface transport procedures for the UN field staff. So the UN field staff, when they are going on the surface, they use a fleet effectively. That's what we look at. Coming back to the driver's handbook. The driver is a person who drives a vehicle. That's also the definition. I will look around who drives the vehicle. We put a wide range of vehicles around. If you look at the list of equipments, it could be from a motorcycle of 125 cc's going to a vehicle of 16 persons, 8 persons, whatever capacity. Now, driver is required to ensure, comply with the UN security measures. And when we talk of those security measures, obviously, we are looking at the speed limit, the min and the max, local rules of the roads, minimum operating security standards we have got for each one, and the driver's responsibility as well. Coming back to the next one is the vehicle's requirement. Now, any field vehicle should always be driven by a driver because the person has been trained for that. So the person was, who's called as a driver, only they should drive. It. And we should keep in mind because we are in a worn town areas, we are in a conflict zone sometime. Each and every vehicle should have a double time. The roof rack should be masked. The first aid cage should be there around. The fire extinguisher, in case it happens, should be there. Two spare tires, not the one, two. High lift jack, communication equipment, HF, VHF, UHF, whatever the case may be, you need those ones around. And in some cases, you should have a laptop also where you can transfer the information as well. Emergency spare parts. Now, vehicles check which are required on a daily basis. But you are in those places where the fuel is not easily available for miles and miles. So you have to check the fuel level, you have to check the oil level, you have to check if there's any damage. Electricals are fine, good. Even the rubbers, like wipers, belt of the fan, are they working or not? So you have to check before you start your journey. The master key should be maintained. I would say no journey will start without security clearance. Nobody can start without getting security clearance because they have to tell the route, which route they're going. Security has to check 
that there are no issues on the way. And sign travel authorizations. Now, when we talk of driving, it's from sunrise to sunset normally. It is normally not advisable in the dark time to avoid any casualties. And if required, but then you need a security clearance. And for every time, the logbook has to be maintained. Now, when I talk of scheduled services, obviously every vehicle, it should be performed religiously, I would say, after every 5,000 kilometers. We have vehicles, some of them are driving off-roads, sometimes wet condition, you have to close to the water. Finally, if you talk of four-wheel drive, you use it for if you're driving off-road. If you're driving on main road, I think it takes more traction and consume more fuel otherwise. So the four-wheel drive is more drive advisable when you're driving off-road. Or is sometimes it's a sandy area, it's a muddy area, soft earth, water crossing, you need a four-wheel drive. Or if you're driving on an icy or snow-covered roads, again, there you need a four-wheel drive. But if you're going through the during wet or stormy weathers, these are just risky. And if you check your brake once you're crossed through the waters around, check your mirrors when there are no danger around. Another, when we talk of a safe driving, sometimes, as you know, in the UN, they go in a convoy. So, convoy means there is somebody leader, the vehicles, six, seven vehicles are following each other. So, the drivers are need to maintain a proper distance from the preceding vehicles. Safe driving, follow the traffic rules. Again, I will emphasize human life is more important. Defensive driving effective observations. Be prepared for any unexpected thing could happen. You may not have planned it, but it happens. So you have to be ready for unexpected things on the road. Avoiding the risk, check vehicles before proceeding, and never get panicked. Stay alert. Because if you get panicked, your system won't be, the brain won't be in a real order, so you're not able to think positively. So don't get panicked. This happens sometimes, carjacking. If you and peacekeeping wins are normally the target of criminals, very common. Below are some of the extra indicators. And these indicators helps you that get an idea that somebody's trying to chase you. Somebody's following you closely and maintaining the same speed as you are going. The guy is not overtaking you, just following you and quickly. I mean, there's a possibility that this guy is, has different intentions. If you're being such situation, the carjack stopping is the safest mode. Stop it. Do not provoke the carjackers. Don't get into fighting around. Don't be try to be a hero. Your life is more important than the world. I'm coming next to the managing the following incidents. If there's a fire, it could happen when you're going in a convoy or you're going along, the fire happens. First thing you should do is switch off the engine. Ensure that you have the fire extinguishers. It could happen in some places, there are mines. And these mines could be anti persons could be anti tank And if you are surrounded by mines, don't try to take a chance to get out of the vehicle and your feet may go on the top of your mines and it will blow up. So the desire is either stay in the vehicles, exit vehicles, either from the roof or from the rear. That could be tied around. And if you see that on there is a vehicle accident has happened and you have to plan the first aid, because you have the first aid kit, First thing is to do with the warning signals and lights all around. Let people know all around that there is something accident has happened here. And if the vehicle which is damaged, switch off the ignition key. And do apply the handbrake. If it might be on a slopey place, so handbrake will save it. Assess the casualty and move it. There will be different types of casualties and they need to be moved. 
Another thing comes up is when you're moving in those places, in jungles and war-torn areas and difficult places, mobile communication is very, very critical. Now, obviously, when we talk about mobile communications, vehicle tracking need to be carried out for all vehicles traveling outside cities and town. As I said earlier, each vehicle should have HF, VHF radios for tracking and communication. You need to be tracked to the GPS systems. You want to communicate. So in those situations, you will need to run. Normally, what we think around the driver is the responsibility for to operate radio. No, the passengers are also trained, so they used to, they need to be trained on how to use the radios. Now, HF communications are used for tracking. If contact is lost, try contact on VHF, portable satellites, phones are also available. Now, there's another thing also when if you are carrying the goods. And if I'm involved in transportation, I'm carrying the goods around, and each goods may be, some may be hazardous goods. Some might be gases, some might be explosives. So when we move them, they have to move with the typical class labels. If they're explosive symbols, means a black background with the orange color. Non-flammable non gases, white background with the green. Then there are inflammable gases symbol would be a flame symbol. And that symbol would be red on a white background. There could be inflammable liquid as well. Again, you will show the flame on a white background with the red color. There are some substances which are oxidizing substances and then flame over a circle you need to show the back background with the yellow. But this gives you broadly some of the ones which I'm sure you're all conversing. Talks of highly inflammable, highly flammable, corrosives, again, irritant ones, low hazard, toxic, explosive, fire hazards, very toxic, caution, harmful. So whenever you're carrying this, the symbols are must. So if somebody's trying to train you, follow you behind, they know these are the ones there. Coming back to the UN driving standards, so everybody understood from the driver's side, now let's understand the driving standard, what the UN has put down. Because the UN people come from different backgrounds, different nationalities. So there is a need for understanding common standards around. And the objective behind all the UN driving standard is to reduce accidents, condition to use UN vehicles, Parking, where to park and how to park, how to follow when you're in the part of the convoy, and disciplinary actions. So the very first thing comes is when we talk of the standards, the focus is about the driver's fault. Now they are personally responsible for the proper use and care of their own permit. Everybody has a permit, they are responsible. They should contain the UL logos and mission names and expiry dates. So when they have a permit around, in the permit you have the UN logo, mission name, expiry date. And obviously the second part they have to be worried about is that they have not to be careless. If they're carrying very dangerous driving and negligible driving, in those situations they have to be careful. Driving under the influence of alcohol, which is not allowed. So drivers should not be driving if they are in the influence of alcohol or any drugs around. Speeding, as I said earlier, which is very critical within the limit, the min and the max. Road categories, you have to keep in mind when you're driving, is it the built-up areas, is it the non-built-up areas, or is the rural roads, which are not surfaced. So in those situations, different kind of approaches have to be followed. Another thing comes up is on the restraining and the other safety devices. Seat pads should be worn by all of them. It is not the driver alone. Everybody in the vehicle should have the seat pads. Number of passengers should not exceed the limit. If the seat, eight seaters should be only eight seaters, no nine. Everybody needs a space. Children should never sit on the front seats. No children should be made to sit on the front seats. 
walking around the vehicles to check the clearances. Normally when we come out before we drive, walk around, understand how much is the clearance in the back. Sometimes we just walk into the vehicle and start the engines, and then we take care of it reverse and we hit with someone. So it's a good practice, walk around the vehicle before you start, look around how much is the clearance at the back before starting to reverse. Vehicle should not be driven on a downgrade. If you're going on the downgrade side with gears in neutral, sometimes people think, oh, let me save some energy now. They put in the neutral, clutch is also disengaged, so vehicle is moving with his own weight. So I think that is not good. Coming back to the next thing, the training programs, which are very, very important around. It serves two purposes, to improve the skill of the drivers and motivate them as well. Now, obviously, we are trying to look at enhance the caliber of the skills for safe driving so that they understand driving is not just moving the vehicles, making it drive safely. So the drivers for the safe driving and the conditions of the safe driving. Those who are really good, they need to be recognized. It is recommended that the task force sections arrange, conduct briefing. I think this is where sometimes the chief transport officers or someone else who's dealing with them, they should conduct the briefing. Provide them the problems and the concern and the challenges so that those can be mitigated, the risk can be mitigated. Now, these programs should provide desired outcome, including the road safety policies, vehicle operating standards, familiarization with local conditions, and emission protocols. You might be carrying different types of equipment. You might be driving a vehicle which the guy may not have driven anywhere else before joining you in. So you need to familiarize with the equipment, what type of features are there and as I was saying earlier, the rewards for safe driving, there are normally two types of rewards which are used. One is given by the force commander's road safety certificate. Now it is awarded to the unit with accident below one per 150,000 kilometers. Then we also have individual safe driving certificate. Now this one is given to the individuals for driving at least 3,000 kilometers without any accident any violations. Traffic violation is required, in all the, no violation should be there. And then when we talk of individual, it should not be the person who has joined just a month back, at least the person should have worked for five to six months minimum. Next come to the fleet control. So you have a fleet, maybe you have 500 vehicles, 1000 vehicles, it is the management of the transportation fleet. So when we say fleet, and normally it does not mean only vehicle, it could be even the ship and the plane is complete fleet. The challenging responsibility to maintain the fleet cost effective and efficient. Now, when we talk of the fleet control systems, we are looking for a system which can take care of operational fleet monitoring or vehicle dispatch, when to dispatch, which one has to go tracking all the assets. So if I have got 300 vehicles around, tracking each and every asset. Security and the safety management, condition-based maintenance. If they're scheduled for a particular maintenance, my system should answer me, this vehicle is due for repair on time, change of plan. This is due for change of plan, change of this. So that has to be done in due time. Coming back to the next one, fleet monitoring, real-time information on the vehicles, drivers, cargo, vehicles, cargo management, vehicle material. If you have a real-time information, so certainly you are able to make a better decision. And on top of it, you've got a GPS tracking device. It creates a solution that is suitable for all fleet types and sizes. Now let's look at the, the ones around the fleet management challenges which we have today. First thing is the real-time monitoring the status and the position of the vehicles. You are the head of the transport, you want to know what is the status of this vehicle around, where it is, in terms of its condition, the locations. If somebody is doing idling also in the vehicles 
and you want to check around with the bike idling when you're wasting the fuel. And you want to check how many vehicles are idling around at this time. Unauthorized users, the person who's driving is not supposed to drive. And it is not even approved by the office, it's not security clearance has not been given around. Tracking of late arrival. Somebody was supposed to come at this time, the guy has not reached. And you want to track it where it is at the designated location. Difficulty in fleet maintaining a track of service records of the vehicles. You want to see the service records. Waiting for the vehicles for a long time. Somebody is waiting and that guy was supposed to leave. All these things affect the work around. Another one comes with the operational fleet plan monitoring. And this is to track the vehicles. As I said earlier, it's a GPS based. It helps in getting the vehicles, locations, direction, speed, all that information. And this information we pass on to the fleet management software applications. Data transmissions include both either could be terrestrials or and satellite. Obviously, satellite tracking is more expensive but works without interruption. So this shows you from the GPSI. There's another one, communication via Thruaya also, that is another one which is based in UAE. So you see around different ways and information is passed onto the control unit and to the vehicle control unit. This gives beautifully another one, the GPS satellite is there, signals. And then from there, I go to the, through the wireless network, it goes to the wireless servers, through internet, it goes to my the main software, where I can control through the main dashboard all the information. For the fleet management, as I said earlier, we are basically looking around what? I want to track the route, expense, how much is costed last week on a real time basis. I want to schedule the fleet around. Somebody comes up and we need the vehicle for this time, this day. You can schedule it. You can also schedule maintenance. The fleet analytics, you want to do each and every vehicles. What are the problems with that? Which one needs more maintenance cost? Which is the less one? So the fleet analytics can also be done. You can also track the fuel. Which vehicle is consuming more? Which one is less? And you can also look around the driver's safety monitor. What minimum speed the guy is driving around, what maximum speed the guy is driving around. You can get all that information and the utilization of the fleet. Am I using the fleet? If my utilization is only 20%, something is wrong. Either I've got a bigger fleet than required. So all those things are required around. So you have the GPS system for tracking. Then from the system, you are passing all this information to one central place where this software can manage all this information. A key benefits the way we look around from the tracking is it saves money and time. Comprehensive vehicle tracking is important, improve the convenience management. Administrative load goes down, otherwise, you're doing manually and trying to look around the person, the drivers vehicles, unforeseen situations, if anything could happen. If some particular vehicle is going on a route and then you got the message from the security side, there are problems, you can pass on the information and divert the route. Improve the customer service, increased utilization from your fleets, enhanced vehicle and driver safety, reduce operational costs and reduce fuel costs. If I go broadly into the game system which we were showing you earlier, the very first thing which if any one of you have already got the system great, if not, look into these features around, which will make your life much more better and better utilization of resources. Obviously. Now, first thing is the dashboard should be very friendly. It gives you the complete summarized data and easy to understand charts and graphs. Enables to view the snapshot of entire fleet in one screen. I should be able to see 
If I'm sitting in the front of a dashboard as a chief transport officer or head of the transport, I should be able to see in a one snapshot the entire fleet at one screen. Option to export the summarized data along with this chart in PDF, Excel, that facility should be available. The next thing is the monitor part. Now, monitors should be able to give you real time location, status of the vehicles in the digitized map, displays the warning and the critical alerts in the last 24 hours, and users can map the position of the selected vehicle by select. Full screen view you should be able to have on the monitors. The next come the history part. That means if I want to see through my system the entire trip of the vehicles from the specified duration on the map with current positions, provide the information of point that is plotted in this one on the map when the cursor is placed over it, and list various trip information, physical location, date, time, speed, and mass. So this is where you can pull the history part. The next thing comes up is alerts messages. So alert messages means provide the list of alerts generations. Again, alerts could be because of security. Alerts could be the guy the fuel is getting over, how the fuel is leaking, and then the geodomes and the landmarks. Create and manage a custom landmark for street address, geolocation, that should be able to find. Another one which is important around is the fleet maintenance, manage the services, the maintenance for vehicles based on odometers, engine hours, time-based, track plan cost versus actual cost. You might have got actual cost versus what are the plan costs. And the reports, the reports could be the driver management, vehicle utilizations, fleet maintenance, last but not the least is configurations. So I would say around if any software which you have or appears in I hope it addresses all the needs. The key important thing is the fleet security. That is what is expected from the transport management. The guy that should be able to secure the fleet. Remote vehicles, which are disabling systems, plays a key role. I think this is a wonderful tool. If you get an idea that somebody has stolen your vehicle and you can disable the system from the remote, and these systems are available. So sitting in a remote basis, I can disable the car. Nobody can use it. This includes the security of vehicle while stopped and not in operations. And if some vehicle are stopped on the way for some reasons, and you are worried that this thing is stolen, you can basically disable the system from remote. So this will reduce the chances of theft and loss. Some system will lock the brakes and will not allow the vehicle to start within a certain time. I've seen some system which disables for a short moment, then you give it time, cooling time, and then it starts again. So there are some other systems which can lock the brake as well from the remote. And you can also create a panic button. That means if I'm driving around and if I find something is going wrong, you are being carjacked, you can press the car panic button also. So that panic button will give the message to my main office that guys, this vehicle is in trouble. So I think each vehicle should have a panic button also. Now coming back to the fleet manager now, the person who's managing all this, obviously they play a key role. He or she is responsible for selecting first and maintaining the vehicles in order to keep deliveries. They play a key role, what type of vehicles are being selected? So the very first thing which I look from the fleet manager is selecting the vehicle what type of vehicles, depending on the need. Record keeping is very, very crucial for ensuring compliance because if more audit happens, you should have ensured compliance and maintenance. Driver main management. 
the needs drivers with good communication skills. It's very, very important. The drivers should be able to communicate well. And they should be reliable drivers. Next one, which is also important, the education and training. I mean, I would say the most of the fleet managers should have a very good knowledge and understanding of the best practices of logistics. And they should be able to train their own team and share their own best practices with others. In the process, they should build their competencies also. When it comes to surface transport procedures, which is very crucial, that means UN has its own course to assign vehicles and the control of vehicles. Clear identification of mission vehicles, very important. You must have seen all mission vehicles with a big UN logo on the top, on the side, on the front. All personal vehicles, the vehicles of senior officials, or the CTO, the chief transport officer, reports to the chief of mission and is responsible for operation and its completion. Now, the transport maintenance unit is supportive mechanism to CTO and surface transport section of the UN headquarters prepared vehicle establishment. So, technically, they have the guidelines, they develop, they prepare the vehicle establishment depending on the size of the mission how many vehicles are required, what type of equipments are required, they decide. Now, if you talk of vehicle establishment, it covers wide range of vehicles, starting from a very light passengers, I would say starting from a motorcycle, a 125cc light passenger vehicles, which could cover up to eight persons, mission specific vehicles could be there around, and it could be also armored vehicle. I remember when I traveled to many times to Afghanistan, so on the UN assignment, armored vehicle also there. Acquisition of transport equipment. So very, very important around acquisition means we're spending a major chunk of funds there. So follow standardization, standardization. UN has developed the standards for vehicles, spares, all equipment which are used around for the transportation. So when you use the standardization, if I'm in the X mission and I've got a fleet of one particular brand, if I want to increase more, I will prefer to have the same brand so that I can use the spares of one with another. Easy field service. And I don't have to train the persons again, the guys, hey guys, sir, you want a new vehicle now? I've not been trained on this. Can you explain me, arrange the training cost? So the normal preference would be whatever fleet you have, you would like to expand the same thing. Same models, same things around. Use of commercial models, which are the commercial models in the place where you're working. It's easier to replaceable. Armored vehicles, certainly very, very important around the security risk areas. And there are a wide range of specifications. So, Next comes the replacement of outdated vehicles. If vehicles are getting outdated, their reliability is very poor, and you're sending that vehicle outside on a mission, I think you're playing with the life of people. So replacement of outdated vehicles. Global systems contracts. Obviously, UN has, I would say most of the UN family organizations have developed the global systems contract which helps us because with system contract, we're able to leverage the volume. And in the process, we get the economies of scale and standardization. Coming back to the utilization of UN vehicles, director, the chief of mission and the sole responsibility for assignment. UN vehicles can be used for official purposes, obviously for peacekeeping military actions medical or physical verifications. Non-mission vehicles can't be taken out of the mission A. UN vehicles are limited to staff members of the missions, dependent of internationals in staff, experts, staff of UN agency and officials. So this is a broad meaning who are eligible to use this amount. When it comes to free performance now, I mean, this could be used by use of electronic vehicle monitoring system. If you have, we call it EVM, S, 
which is used for this. Law helps to improve the vehicle management, safety and security, unauthorized use. So if you're having EVMS, it can help in all these aspects of it. Above provides operation parameters, journey time, distance travel, max and min speed, traffic violation, if any, complete information can be tracked and traced in EVMS. Vehicle occupancy service. I'm taking a vehicle of 16 people, but only two people have been used all the time. So that means I'm carrying a bigger vehicle than required a lot. Fleet rotation is done to enhance the performance. Idling should be avoided or reduced. Driver permit categories. So the permit category, this Vienna Convention on the type of vehicle shows you what type of vehicles are used in principle. Starting from the motorcycle, going up to very heavy equipment, going up to armored vehicles, so it gives you the chain of equipment where and when to do it. Coming back to the performance part, the fleet performance, the very first thing I said to you earlier, three E's, fleet performance, inputs, output, outputs and this, total cost of ownership. That is very critical around, it is not the price what you paid up front, the maintenance cost, operation cost, Storing cost, the whole complete TCO philosophy till you dispose of performance efficiencies, performance indicators, and performance again the fleet performance management processes because sometimes the process could be also complex. This is very crucial. I mean, UL is obviously very proud, and they send the right masses to the people wherever their vehicles are used. The kept in very good, clean and good conditions. All vehicles and major equipment to be used in mission area must be painted white with a black UN lettering plate on displayed on the top. So the UN logo would be in the black. It could be on the top, front, sides and rear of the vehicle. The minimum size of the UN has to be 30 centimeters, height-wise 45 centimeters, and you will find, you could have bigger than that, this is the minimum size. UN provides the third party liability insurance cover and provides the number plates. So all number plates are given by the UN. No flags other than the UN is permitted on any vehicles. And the flag size is also minimum 13 to 45. Vehicle license plates, all vehicles must carry license plate and normally carry five digit number after letter UN. So UN is put on the black, painted in the black and followed by minimum five digits, whichever is given by the UN office there. Coming back to the fleet cost control. Now, when we talk of cost, obviously this plays a key role to improve the effectiveness. Now the key measures when we look at the fleet cost control that is follows. First thing is, Reduce the fleet size. Obviously, very understood. Smaller the fleet, your cost goes down. Next one, cut miles travel. The guy might be traveling around, but it's unnecessary trip. If those trips which can be unnecessary, we can drop it, it saves the money. Another one, which is it's a no-brainer thing, I would say get more mileage. And the mileage could come from many angles, the driver behavior, reduce the vehicle size. They could also lead to more mileage. The lower fuel cost, the fuel is one of the largest expense when I look at the fleet. So the fuel cost, how we can cut down, including when you're trying to negotiate a good price for the fuel locally. Lower total cost of ownership, the crashes, if it happens, if any accident happens, how do we get repair done? Those costs also has to be reduced. And any overhead costs, also known as indirect costs, how do we cut? Overhead costs, the administrative costs, those costs could be there. So when we are looking at the cost reduction, this becomes one of the critical issue, which I said in the beginning, it's vehicle abuse value. People are using it for personal purposes, for private business activity. Reporting on speeding and excessive idling around. Is that abuse? 
weekend and after I was traveling logged it out. Ignition in slash off notification indicates user vehicles. So driver identification invalid. Manage the persons, people who are behind this. Know it all the time, real time, exactly where your person are. We have a big team. You need to know where they are. Follow the trips on screen in real time if necessary. Notify and use the person nearest to the customer or our task to be done. Allocate remote controls. Verify who used which vehicle at all times. <clears throat> now coming back to the gain reduction of the fleet cost. Smaller fleet, as I said to you earlier. Vehicle miles travel, VMT. More mileage per gallon. Lower fuel cost. Reduce the vehicle life cycle cost. Lower maintenance cost. And the last, the lower overhead cost. And let's see the one example of the smaller fleet. Around. Example of 1,000 vehicles. Fleet. Let's assume that $5,000 per vehicle savings light duty, if you're talking light duty vehicles. If I cut down by 20 vehicles, from 1,000, if I cut down by 20, I'm saving around close to 100,000 per year. If I cut down from 1,000 vehicles, 10 percent, which is 100 vehicles, I'm saving around half a million. And if I cut down 200 vehicles, that means I'm cutting down by 20 percent, my saving is around a million dollars per year. So you can imagine this gives a very simple mathematics guys cutting on the fleet obviously has an impact on the cost saving. Another is good thing is about the mileage part. Vehicle has to be fuel efficient. And then let's look around honestly weight of the in the vehicle. You're carrying something extra, which is not required. Just extra 50 kgs can if you cut down the weight by 50 kgs, it can improve your mileage by 2%. So if you look at a thousand vehicles, fleet of thousand vehicles, saving two percent, three percent like this can bring big savings. Reduce the idling part and driver claim. Sometimes they go on a very high speed. And if you go on an aerodynamic basis also, you get much more resistance of air on the front and it consumes more fuel. So you need to have an optimum speed. So neither the lower speed, it consumes more, and if it's more than the optimum speed, also consumes much better. Ensure your vehicles are properly maintained. That is very, very crucial. Coming back to the operation evaluations. Now, operational variables, if I look around, very first thing is the people who are supporting you. There's an operation team which is supporting you to the transport unit. You want something to be done quickly and they take a long time to respond. Your vehicle is down. You want a fan belt. The guy takes a month. So your vehicle is just waiting. It can't go anywhere. Information on status of orders. You have placed some orders with the procurement unit and they are not coming. They're efficient. Supply chain costs, inventory costs. You're carrying a big inventory of the goods or spare parts. Those also you need to look around. The cost of waste. And then you find after five years, oh, this item has never been used and you kept in the inventory. That's a waste for you. And that cost of the waste has to be looked into. Reporting performance, on-time delivery, delivery of exact specs around. You might have asked for a particular specification and particular material. The procurement people are giving you very late. Specs are different. Quantity is different than what you asked. So these could be the operational variables Performance matrix, as I said in the beginning, fuel efficiency you have to look around. Safety score has to be looked around. Insurance may not be relevant much here because this is third party insurance, which is done by the UN. There's a need for a standard. You might be looking yourself and think that I'm the law and technically you're not, you're still the cap. So there's a need for standardized KPIs, performance indicators. If you are able to do the performance indicator, then you can assess yourself where you stand really. So when we talk of sample KPIs, well, these are the matrix. 
used to monitor performance of fleet on an ongoing basis. And compare with the benchmark. It is not just looking at the performance, but comparing with the benchmarks is very important around. I've just taken up broadly the top five KPIs. The very first one is utilization. The actual amount of time that an asset is actively used. I've got the assets around. How much I'm using it? 20%, 30%, 80%? 80%? You know very well after seven or eight years, the vehicle has life is over. So how much I'm using on a daily basis? Cost per hour. How much it costs me to use this asset? Because each and every transport equipment is an asset for you. And how much it costs me to operate on an hourly basis, per hour basis? Cost per unit. And if there's a problem, something happens around, how much time it takes for me to put back into the normal situation? On the way that there's a crash, vehicle has met with an accident, now it goes for a repair. Does it remain in that place, service place, for one month, 15 days, two months? So that time I want to see on a meantime basis. And lastly, but not the least, is preventive maintenance. How well it is done. The compliance part. The ability to complete the preventive maintenance in time. So this is what we are looking around, preventive maintenance compliance part. But this gives you, the, once you've got the KPIs, you can do the value analysis of your own fleet. The two broad parameters I will take up, the cost per hour, percentage utilization. If my cost per hour is low, utilization is high, I'll keep it. But if my cost per hour is very high, and utilization is also very high, I will replace it. But my cost per hour is very high, utilization is negligible, then I will retire the vehicle. The cost per hour is very low, utilization is less, then I will move it. I'll move the fleet, particularly equipment, to some other place to improve its utility. Now, the Lastly, what I would like to also emphasize, the way I have seen that around most of the fleet, the focus is all the time on maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. So when I use the word maintenance, to me, it's a reactive approach. Oh, now the vehicle is down, let me do it maintenance. So the focus should be make the transition from fleet maintenance to fleet management. So the word fleet management means you become more strategic. You become proactive. So before the vehicle is down, you take care of the preventive part in advance. So move the culture, migrate simply from chain the oil culture. Okay, guys, I need an oil, just put the oil in on. To full-fledged management operator of the entire field. The keys to the transitions, I would say, effective safety program you need, measure your progress all the time, Invest in technology. I think that plays a crucial role. If I have a good technology, as I showed to you in the beginning, the right software around, sitting at a remote place, I can tell which vehicle has to be taken out, which has to be replaced, which has to be moved. So that's the way it is there. Invest in technologies, drive change and culture. So change has to happen. The mindset has to change of the people. Staff training and development and be socially responsible. That is also a key thing. This thing around. I think this is the message I want to close. I mean, I, would, I want to close with this message. Make the transition, transition from fleet maintenance to fleet management. With this, friends, I want to thank you all. I hope you had a good time. Enjoy the day and have a good time. Thank you, my friend.